Friends, we are delighted that you joined us on this uh, final uh, event of the Choose to Believe lecture series for this fall. Uh, students, uh, faculty, staff, uh, friends of the university, we're delighted to have all of you here with us today. My name is John Rosenberg. I'm the um, Associate Academic Vice President for Undergraduate Studies in my office along with um, uh, all of the colleges on campus are, have been sponsoring uh, this lecture series uh, during this uh, semester. We're delighted uh, that Terrell is uh, with us uh, once again. Uh, you know Terrell uh, already, I suspect most of you, as the Senior Research Fellow at the Maxwell Institute. Uh, those of us who have known Terrell for decades were delighted when he finally made the choice uh, to come to Provo after an illustrious uh, career back east. Uh, and that has resulted in professional opportunities for many of us and a renewal of uh, cherished uh, friendships uh, that the proximity uh, allows in ways that the thousands of miles of distance didn't. Um, as I mentioned, this is the fourth and final lecture of the Choose to Believe lecture series. The first one we did back in September, titled The Doors of Faith. That was followed up the, the following month by Awful Woundedness, The Nature of God and Humans. In November, the great plan of happiness, the atonement, is not plan B. And the title uh, for today's lecture is Worlds Without End, the, less, uh, the Lesson of, of Enoch. Uh, for those of you who are students, I would uh, call your attention to the fact that Professor Givens will be teaching a class winter semester on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, at 4 o'clock. Uh, we still have a few seats available in that class and uh, would encourage you to consider um, registering in one of two options. It is listed both as English 337R and H call, that is Humanities College, uh, 480R, again, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 o'clock. And the subject of the class will be literature and doubt. Did I get that right, Terrell? Uh, following uh, Professor Gibbons' uh, lecture, uh, we will uh, turn to a question and answer period and look forward to that exchange. Uh, we would especially encourage students uh, to uh, uh, ponder the things that Professor Gibbons uh, uh, will tell us this afternoon and to prepare questions. And Terrell, I think we'll want to give the students the first shot at those questions. So those of you who are post students, who we could ask you to just be patient and make sure we give ample opportunity to our young people and then we'll turn uh, that question and answer uh, more broadly uh, to all of you. Uh, Brian Samuelson, uh, a uh, major in marketing from Tucson, Arizona, will offer the invocation and then we will turn the time to uh, Terrell Gibbons. Father in heaven, uh, we offer our thanks today that we can gather here to hear from Dr. Givens um, in this closing lecture of his lecture series. We're grateful for the insights that he has offered and for the spirit that has attended his his lectures. I'm grateful for the research that he has done and the um, the hope that he has offered as we have uh, come to a greater knowledge of thee and of thy gospel. We pray that today as we conclude the lecture series um, that our hearts and minds can be open to the feelings and um, thoughts that um, his uh, talk will engender and we pray that we can um, internalize those and help ourselves to become more like thee and to become an exalted um, great family together. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here again for this concluding lecture, Worlds Without End. I know some of you are beginning to think the lecture series is lectures without end. Um, I'm going to start um, asking your indulgence because in my previous life I was a professor of literature and religion, specializing in the Romantic era. 
So I want to begin with a passage from a classic poem of that era by David O. McKay's favorite poet, Robert Burns. A farmer has just disturbed the home of a field mouse and apologizes for its destruction. And he laments the general fragility of life in the natural world. But then he considers, speaking to the mouse, the other side of the coin. Still, thou art blessed compared with me. The present only toucheth thee, but ah, I backward cast my eye on prospects drear, and forward though I cannot see, I guess and fear. Today I want to speak about fear and hope and worlds without end. In my first lecture I made the claim that if we embrace the gospel wittingly as well as willingly, we can perceive the full beauty of God's face and will never forsake him. Since then, I've attempted to limb the features of what I think is the most morally and rationally compelling theology ever presented for human consideration. In the second lecture, I presented two of the Restoration's most remarkable teachings of a father whose heart is vulnerable, is set upon us, and beats in sympathy with ours, and of a soul that is eternal and comes from a place of glory. In my third lecture, I described our mortal, mortal sojourn as an educative ascent, not a catastrophic fall, and the role of Christ as our healer from life's wounds. Today, I turn to the question of what awaits us in our future. And I wish to testify of my conviction that our heavenly parents have the desire and they have the capacity to bring their plan to fruition. That means they will nurture and tutor and guide us with unceasing patience, and that heaven is not a reward we earn or a place awarded, but a condition of sanctified life in sanctified relationship with others to which they will guide us. So what awaits you, you in particular, after your passing? The mystic Emanuel Swedenborg may have expressed it best when he wrote, it is a person's ruling love that awaits her after death. It is a person's ruling love that awaits her after death. How do you know what your ruling love is? C.S. Lewis wrote of a time to come when, quote, you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should God hear the babble that we think we mean? My own belief is that in large measure our deepest, our most authentic, and not always conscious ruling love is the pole star toward which we incline moment by moment. No more powerful force than love exists in the universe, and it draws us onward. That is one reason why faith must be a choice. God wants our assent freely given, not as a product of intellectual reasoning or pious self-interest or fear and trembling. Those may be way stations along the path to him. Ultimately and ideally, we find ourselves in a place where no certainties compel us, nor impossibilities dissuade us. It seems to me obvious that everywhere we turn, we find ourselves in this vortex of competing forces that cancel each other out, leaving us free to choose. That seems to be an inescapable part of the whole design. Oh, true enough, we never inhabit that ground of perfect equilibrium. Environment and upbringing and culture and genes all have their say. But when the dust settles and the white noise clears, we find no compulsion in one direction or another. The compass needle of our soul swings free, gently inclined to respond to that space of freedom to what Spadenborg called our ruling love. And it is then that we will choose and act and trust or not trust the needle's gentle movement, guided by our ruling love. But know this, the ruling love that guides your fate can change, does change, and is changing even now. But is it changing in the direction to give you a basis for hope? 
the stakes are high as two of the most terrifying verses in the Book of Mormon record. As we read in Jacob, because they desired it, God hath done it. We're again in Alma, unto them it was granted according to their desires. So the question is, how do we know that when our life's review takes place, we will be found desiring, loving the right things with our affections centered in the right person? Anxiety is probably the most pervasive wound of our age. We worry about our families and our friends. We worry about our jobs and our grades and our relationships. We worry about our future, our major, our graduation, our career choices, next week's finals, and our faith commitments. And having made those faith commitments, we worry about where they will take us here and hereafter. Historically, you should recognize that religious anxiety in particular has been the catalyst to some of the world's great religious revolutions. The intense craving for relief from the fears of death and damnation gave rise to the Protestant Reformation in the person of a deeply troubled Martin Luther. Anxiety over the state of his soul led John Wesley to searching and spiritual rebirth that spawned and turned the Methodist Church. Joseph Smith, in his 1832 First Vision account, confessed that he too was unsettled, anxious, and seeking some assurance of his standing before God when he entered the woods that spring morning of 1820. When the Protestants broke with the Church of Rome, they lost the assurance that had been a function of receiving the authorized church sacraments. Luther found a new ground for assurance in salvation by grace alone. But if you're a Latter-day Saint, being neither Catholic nor Evangelical, you do not have either of those options available to you. How do we find assurance and hope and confidence and the peace that passes understanding as we contemplate the eternal worlds? If our ruling love awaits us, if the law of restoration guarantees that the only certainty is that our desires will find their eventual and inevitable fulfillment, how can we be sure that our love and desires will take shape as they should? I believe that Joseph Smith restored a gospel that gives us that assurance. There's irony here because we Latter-day Saints do not commonly employ terms like omnipotence or omnipresence to describe our Heavenly Father. He is spatially finite, embodied, self-limiting in regard to our agency. And yet here is the glorious point. Our God, the weeping God of Enoch, or rather the heavenly parents in whose courts our spirit resided in eons past, have the desire and they have the capacity to bring all of their children home to an exalted place in the eternal worlds. That was the plan from the beginning. No other prospect could have made the sons of God shout for joy. This should be obvious. We read that the day will come when God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain. But if God shall wipe away all tears, he can only do so by triumphing over the cause of those tears, which is death's severing of our most intimate family ties and associations. Any joy we savor in the absence of loved ones is a partial joy, a fractured joy. Heaven apart from those we love is just hell by another name. We have confidence in the end of the story because we know how it began. We did not begin in a lost and fallen world, but in a family circle in the company of the gods. As the great mystic Julian of Norwich taught, by using an analogy that she perceived in vision, quote, our parents have sent us into this world to do his will. Not only do we go, but we dash and run off at great speed, loving to do our Lord's will. But soon we fall into a ditch and are greatly injured, and then we groan and moan and we cannot rise or help ourselves in any way. At this point in her vision, she looks to see how the Eternal Father responds when his children have fallen. And the voice of the Lord tells her, it is not reasonable that I should punish him for stumbling, but rather reward him for his fright and his fear, his hurt and his injuries and all his woe. 
making him highly and blessedly rewarded forever above what he would have been if he had not fallen, culminating in surpassing honor and endless bliss. A different beginning changes the ending. The earliest Christian writers knew this, how clear and beautiful are so many of the texts from those first Christian centuries before the Augustinian apostasy. Origen spoke words of sweet assurance to those injured by the travails of life in what seemed at times an undeserved sea of troubles. You, soul, could not have reached the palm groves unless you had experienced the harsh trials. You could not have reached the gentle springs without first having to overcome sadness and difficulties. The education of the soul is an age-long spiritual adventure beginning in this life and continuing after death. Elsewhere, he elaborated, the saints, as they depart this life, all remain in some place situated on earth that the divine scripture calls paradise. This will be a place of instruction and a school for our souls. If any are pure in heart and unpolite, of unpolluted mind and well-trained understanding, they will make swift progress and quickly ascend until they reach the kingdom of the heavens, following him who has said, I desire that they may also be with me where I am. Today I am asking you to consider the almost unimaginable import of those words spoken by Jesus Christ on the eve of his death. I desire, he said, I will, that those you have given me be where I am. The Son of God expressly told us that he is desirous of our companionship in those worlds without end, of your companionship. Exodus 33 records the remarkable fact that, quote, the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Sadly, as the great Anglican bishop Kenneth Kirk notes, the fervent hope that the ancient Jews held that they might actually come to see God died out. Quote, different expedients were adopted so that the implication of seeing God face to face might be evaded. Throughout the sacred texts, therefore, the editors developed the habit of substituting the phrase, appear before Yahweh, or be seen by Yahweh, for the original phrase, see Yahweh. When therefore the Old Testament canon closed, various influences combined to dim the hope of the individual that he should actually see God. It is clear, Kirk notes, that our Father is much more desirous of bringing us home than we have been led to believe. One rabbinic tradition tells us poignantly of God's desire to make us peers rather than subjects. Quote, the king went into his garden to speak to his gardener, but the gardener hid himself from him. Then said the king, why hidest thou from me? See, I am even as thou. So too shall God walk with the righteous in the earthly paradise after the resurrection, and they shall see him and quake before him. Then shall he say unto them, Fear not, for lo, I am even as ye. In the New Testament, something of this tender regard survives in one instance as a promise that is astounding in its depiction of a God whose love and regard surpass any expectation that we might reasonably hold. In the Gospel of Luke, the Lord makes this unimaginable promise. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. How can we make sense of this awkward scene? The greatest religious poet of them all, George Herbert, himself struggled to accept this narrative at face value. And he did so only when he had imagined a conversation unfolding at a future time between a guest and his host. I believe that most of you will see yourselves in the guest's words. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. 
But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, the ungrateful, ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Truly, as Joseph Smith taught, our Heavenly Father is more liberal in his views and boundless in his mercies and blessings than we are ready to believe or receive. Another New Testament verse may be offering reassuring words of hope and promise, but we have missed the point because of translation choices once again. I refer to the famous concluding verse of the Sermon on the Mount, the injunction to be perfect. There are two moments of debatable, tra debatable translation choices. You probably know one of them, teleoi, here translated as perfect, means more accurately fully realized or complete. But a second point of dispute concerns the very first word of this injunction, esesthē in Greek, which strictly speaking means you will be. The verb is a future indicative, but is often translated as an imperative, be. Indulge me for just a moment while I explain the grammar and then we will look at what is at stake doctrinally. Now sometimes in Greek, the future indicative can be interpreted as a command, in which case it's called a justive future. However, Jesus generally uses an actual imperative when he wants to give a command, as he does just four verses earlier. All of this is to say that one might, with equal linguistic accuracy, translate Matthew 5.45 this way as does the Bible translator, Kevin Wust. Therefore, as for you, you shall be those who are complete in your character, even as your Father in heaven is complete in his being. If this rendering is plausible, then we are hearing not an intimidating injunction, but words of comfort, assurance, and peace. Follow my counsels, trust in me, keep faith with those covenants and principles, and you will find that you are whole and complete. So where, I ask, is the grounds for this confidence, this assurance that as Julian of Norwich asserted, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. How do we find the anchor of hope that our ruling love awaits us and that our ruling love will be our love of Christ? If life is a school, then we must trust the schoolmaster. I think this is the motif that pervades scripture. I think the Lord is telling us to trust that he loves us beyond imagining, that he can shape our hearts and desires in such a way that our ruling love will guide us to where he is. The key is repentance, but repentance in this scheme means the continual re-education of the heart. The novelist John Williams intimated as much as he wrote of one of his characters. In his extreme youth, William Stoner had thought of love as an absolute state of being to which if one were lucky, one might find access. In his maturity, he decided it was the heaven of a false religion toward which one ought to gaze with amused disbelief and embarrassed nostalgia. Now in middle age, he began to know that it was neither a state of grace nor an illusion. He saw love as a human act of becoming, a condition that was modified moment by moment and day by day by the will and the intelligence and the heart. I've not read a better characterization of love, a gradual, deliberate, willful act of fully realizing the self in relation to the other, involving intelligence as much as emotion. 
Along this path, we must make ourselves, in David White's words, an apprentice to the difficult and fierce revelations of existence. We are all apprentices, but we all have good reason to trust the master. Agnes Collard has written a magnificent book about the difference between ambition and aspiration. When we are ambitious, she writes, we seek to reap better rewards consistent with our values. But when we are aspirational, we seek to embrace better values. Though she employs the language of philosophy, she captures perfectly the trust we much must practice if our hearts are to be shaped by ever more beautiful desires. Human progress in value, she writes, depends on our openness to feeling some goodness before we can make reflective sense to ourselves of that goodness. This call to openness involves opening oneself to being shaped by others, to listen, to attend, to submit oneself to the judgment of those who have a better grasp than oneself. You and I, in our particular predicament, need confidence or faith of two sorts. We must trust that our heavenly parents really can and really will bring each one of us home. And we need the confidence that this particular institution, the Church of Jesus Christ, is the optimal mechanism for assisting us in that process. Now, it is not fashionable to speak of trust in an institution. My institutional trust in the Church of Jesus Christ is rooted in two things, my self-knowledge and in my work as a historian. Simply put, I need you. I need the inspiration that comes from our shared aspirations and disappointments and struggles. I need the discipline of instruction and reminding. I need the discipline of stewardship and sacrifice and service. There are no solitary saints, and I harbor no delusions about my own capacity for unassisted self-transcendence. I am not the measure of all things. I want to be taught. I want to be instructed, and I want to be guided. And I believe that benevolent parents have made provision for revealing their plan and their principles to inspired men who have managed, however imperfectly, to pierce the veil of ignorance that blights the world. And that they have revealed covenants and ordinances that tap into unseen reservoirs of spiritual light and power. And what does my study of history tell me about this institution? With each new revelation from the dust, I learn anew what Hugh Nibley wrote excitedly years ago. The vast mass of fresh facts and voluminous documents that have to do with the primitive church read as if they were written in defense of the Mormon claims. The weight of evidence is so overwhelming in our favor that we need only to point to it, and it will plead our case with a force that no one can deny. Well, what exactly does early Christian history tell us? The documents reveal doctrines and practices that align time and again with the doctrines and practices that Joseph Smith restored. Now, a skeptic might say, well, that only demonstrates a congruence between two churches, ancient and modern. It tells us nothing about the intrinsic inspiration of either one. Perhaps. And yet we find all around us an almost fevered rush on the part of Christian thinkers everywhere to return to these primeval principles. <clears throat> Let me give you more than a half dozen examples, just reviewed quickly, where in case after case, what the world once called LDS heresies have become current orthodoxies, or at least the subject of renewed discussion. The Didache, an early second century manual for Christian communities, clearly described baptism as an adult ordinance, children implicitly having no need. Latter-day Saints deny the original guilt and damnation of unbaptized children in 1830. It would take two more centuries before Pope Benedict's 2007 document, The Hope of Salvation of Infants Who Die Without Being Baptized. In that text, Catholic authorities express the hope, but not the assurance, that perhaps unbaptized infants are not damned. In the second century, Clement taught that the Word of God became man, that thou might become God, or that thou mayest learn from man how to become God. Latter-day Saints recuperated a version of patristic, patristic teaching on theosis and were vehemently attacked for doing so in 1838. 
now one finds a mainstream journal like Christianity Today urging, quote, how the strange yet familiar doctrine of theosis can reinvigorate the Christian life. Origen, as I indicated above, taught that the education of the soul is a, an age-long spiritual adventure beginning in this life and continuing after death. And so Joseph Smith reveals a progressive tiered salvation. But he did so several generations before Karl Barth asked, if God's saving will is supreme, how is eternal loss even possible? In the third century, Pseudo-Clement put this question to Peter. Shall then those be wholly deprived of the kingdom? who have died before his coming? The Latter-day Saints recovered a scheme of salvation for the living and the dead a century and more before, Rob, before John Paul II spoke of universal salvation and Rob Bell asked, well, what if the missionary gets a flat tire? Three more examples. As I indicated in my first talk, Origen taught of a feeling weeping God in the first Christian centuries, but the weeping God that Joseph Smith revealed in 1830 was starkly blasphemous in the face of every Christian creed extent in his lifetime. Then beginning at the end of the 19th century, there began a stampede to embrace that very conception of a God the father who feels and experiences passions. In a related development, more than one theologian is now arguing that if God is passable, well, then he should be corporeal as well. Quote, Christian theology does not exclude in advance all forms of embodiment. It seems possible to develop a theory of divine corporeality, writes one theologian. Scholars now acknowledge the startling fact that, quote, divine embodiment would have been part of the theological mainstream prior to Origen and Augustine. A book that just came out last month, God's Body, goes so far as to say that at the present moment, a critique of the platonic hostility to divine embodiment is now in vogue. Finally, Joseph Smith's restoration of temple worship and temple theology was roundly condemned at the time as bizarre and unchristian. What a difference a few decades makes. Now Marcus von Wellnitz notes the obvious fact that, quote, early Christians engaged in the dual worship of meeting house and temple. And SGF Brandon writes, there is abundant evidence that early Christians continued faithful in their reverence for the temple and in their observance of its worship forms. It's becoming clear that the Latter-day Saints didn't deviate from early Christianity. Christianity deviated from early Christianity. And now it is in many regards returning. Now maybe these developments are of purely historical interest but I find them compelling evidence of divine inspiration working through a remarkable prophetic 19th century mind to recuperate and expand upon an original Christian gospel. But these examples ultimately are not where my principal hope finds its primary ground. Even from the valleys of uncertainty, I am profoundly and deeply moved by the specter of a young itinerant Galilean rabbi who 2,000 years ago willingly offered himself up to barbaric execution, enduring unspeakable torment because he believed that by doing so, he was offering me, personally, respite from the pains and humiliations and failures and wounds of my life, whether inflicted by others or by my own deliberate foolish choices. As the Book of Mormon testified what happened, I find myself drawn to this unparalleled act of grace and unfathomable kindness to me. Before his divinity or his lordship, his virgin birth or his resurrection ever come into it, I am confronted with the brute historic fact of that Galilean rabbi dying on a cross because he believed his death would enhance my life. Though he is my redeemer and my healer and my God, I find the response that precedes any act of faith is my response to an act of selfless, unmerited love by a flesh and blood individual who lived 20 centuries ago. That is where I first confront the truth about love. It is a truth most ably articulated by Kenneth Kirk. He wrote, three things are true about love. The first is that it always confers independence upon the object of its love. It gives compelling no return. It goes on giving though no love is given an answer. It is the one force in the world that does not bargain. 
Second, if love endows the recipient with formal freedom, with a right to accept or reject it at will, it also and it alone confers upon the giver actual freedom. Man becomes free as he learns to love. And finally, love is irresistible. And therefore, whatever in the end opposes it must in the end give way. The same power which confers freedom on its recipients also evokes from them not by contract, not by force, but by the invincible suasion of a moral appeal, an answer, an answer of love freely given in return. I therefore take as scripture the words of Clement, who believed as I do, that we can set no limits to the agency of the Redeemer, to redeem, to rescue, to discipline his work, and so will he continue to operate after this life. That sentiment was echoed by a modern prophet, Joseph F. Smith, who said, Jesus had not finished his work when his body was slain. Neither did he finish it after his resurrection from the dead. Although he had accomplished the purpose for which he came to the earth, he had not fulfilled all his work. And when will he? Not until he has redeemed and saved every son and daughter of our father, Adam, that have been or ever will be born upon this earth to the end of time, except the sons of perdition. That is his mission. Jesus Christ is committing to shaping our hearts and shaping our love to align with his. I trust in his patience and his power to do so. That is the source of my confidence and my hope. I worship a Christ who wants peers, not subjects, friends, not cowering servants. He comes as our healer, not our judge. If you don't believe that, listen to the words of John the Beloved. He wrote, for God did not send his son to the world in order to judge the world, but in order to heal the world. Insofar as there is judgment, according to the Apostle Paul, it will be a process of helpful assessment to prepare us for progress to the next stage of our growth. As he taught the Corinthians, being judged, we are corrected by the Lord in order that we be not condemned. This is what Elder Uchtdorf likely meant when he said, that day of judgment will be a day of mercy and love, a day when broken hearts are healed, when tears of grief are replaced with tears of gratitude, and when all will be made right. As for hell, I trust the words of Elder James Talmadge, who wrote, no man will be kept in spirit prison longer than is necessary to bring him to a fitness for something better. When he reaches that stage, the prison doors will open, and there will be rejoicing among the hosts who welcome him into a better state. I conclude with my testimony, my profession of belief and of hope. I testify that only a God who can redeem all of his creation is worthy of adoration, and that is the God rediscovered by Joseph Smith. I believe the words of Christ when he told his disciples upon leaving them that he would be at work preparing their abode in the worlds without end and that he desires us to be there with him. And I have hope that we will find ourselves there because Christ's love for each one of us whom he knows by name will ultimately prove irresistible. Now two final thoughts. Hope is not complacency. We have to bring Christ's work of at one minute to fruition by lives of commitment and exertion and teachability. Only with our trusting cooperation can he shape the love that rules our lives, what Gerard Manley Hopkins called our soul's star. But trust that that work is even now underway. And second, I pray that you will develop a voracious appetite for the feast already laid before you. The philosopher and consummate pessimist Schopenhauer spoke this pearl of wisdom. Every person takes the limits of their own field of vision for the limits of the world. Don't let that be your error. Be open and teachable and receptive to the bounties, material and spiritual, of the here and now. The Savior said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. 
The key Greek word here was parison, which means full to overflowing, present in superabundance. Our God is a God of superabundance, as described by the poet Robinson Jeffers. Is it not by his high superfluousness that we know our God? For to be equal in need is natural, but to fling rainbows over the rain and beauty above the moon and secret rainbows on the domes of deep seashells and make the necessary embrace of breeding beautiful also as fire, not even the weeds to multiply without blossom nor the birds without music. May you take Charles Darwin as your model in this one regard. Be as passionately receptive to beauty and variety and wonder as he was. When he was a student like yourselves, he was already in love with the adventure of learning. His greatest passion was collecting beetles. He recorded in his journal, I will give you a proof of my zeal. One day on tearing off some old bark, I saw two rare beetles and seized one in each hand. Then I saw a third, a new kind, which I could not bear to lose, so that I popped the one which I held in my right hand into my mouth. Alas, it ejected some intensely acrid fluid which burnt my tongue so that I was forced to spit the beetle out, which was lost, as well as the third one. <laughs> I would encourage you to do whatever is required to make room for the third beetle. Enlarge your heart and mind, enlarge your trust, your faith, and your hope, but make room for that third beetle. Thank you.